Um, it's got a lot of carbon in it. I think that's the key feature of peat. It's, um, it's often developed over thousands of years uh, and it forms because of waterlogging. So all the carbon that's being photosynthesized from the atmosphere can't decompose in the way that it would in a normal soil. So you get this build up year on year, potentially of meters of, of organic matter So peat, it's our most carbon rich um, store in the biosphere really. I mean, it's a slow but steady process so over thousands of years, quite a significant amount of carbon that would otherwise have been in the atmosphere is now locked up in peatlands all over the world. It's, it's like a third of all the soil carbon or more is, is stored. So more than in all the trees in the world is stored in peat. And that's a lot of carbon in summary. Um, and it'll stay that way and it'll keep growing as long as it stays wet. But of course, a lot of peat in the UK hasn't stayed wet because of drainage for agriculture and, and forestry and, and other things. Uh, at the moment, it means we've got a big emission source. It means that something like 4% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, we think, certainly more than 3%, are coming from the decomposition of peat. So where we've exposed all that organic matter to, to oxygen through drainage, basically all the bugs that couldn't process that organic matter without oxygen can now get going and they can get going pretty fast. Um, so we've got very high emission rates across large areas. Um, so at the moment, peat's kind of part of the problem. <laughs> um, but really what we're looking at is whether it could become part of the solution. If you think about where these places are, we've got something like 10% of the UK's land area is or was peat, and some of those areas have lost metres of peat. So, for example, in East Anglia, you'll see the rivers are higher than the land, the land's partly below sea level, and that's creating all sorts of problems for you know, flood management and all these other things. But if you, th if you do the maths on how much carbon you could store, uh, if you could refill that landscape, then it's huge. It's thousands of megatons, so it's enough, in theory, to make a significant contribution to our kind of net zero ambitions if we could find ways to start refilling that kind of lost store of carbon. And I guess that's the challenge. I, mean, I should say we work in the uplands and the lowlands and they are two different things. So the uplands is really very much more about working with natural processes and, and sort of speeding up those recovery trajectories. But, I mean, what we've got in a large part of the uplands, so for example, in the Pennines, Southern Scotland, elsewhere is, what we'd call heather-dominated modified bog, which basically means what was once presumably a sort of sphagnum moss-dominated peat-forming system has become dominated by heather, which is a woody shrub. Uh, gets a little bit drier as a result of that, and that was it's happened for various reasons, but one of them is, is grouse moor management, so rotational burning. The grouse need and they sort of live in the heather and they feed on the heather. So it's created this modified system, and actually air pollution as well wiped out a lot of the mosses. 50 years ago. So it's it's a different kind of thing. It's not very agriculturally productive. It's quite acid. These are not sort of favourable agricultural areas, but there's big, big areas of it. You know, the debate at the moment is either do we keep rotationally burning it, you know, keep the grouse on or, or mow it to sort of keep the biomass down, or do we just leave it? And if you leave it, you get tall heather and you've got wildfire risk. Um, potentially more carbon loss that way than you'll ever get back through anything else. So it's a, it's a way of sort of trying to square the circle of, you know, how do we get from where we are to somewhere else? You know, there is a kind of economic social context to this because there are people whose livelihoods are, are built around, you know, the grouse moor industry and, and those things. So, so if they could, instead of just burning off the heather every 15 years, they could mow it off, buy a char it, gain a value from that, continue with some form of productive management of that land, then there's, you know, there's an opportunity there to work with people on that, within that kind of business model. In the lowlands, it's more about working within farming systems, with farmers, obviously. So the lowland peat demonstrator site that we've got is based at Polybell Farms, just south of Doncaster. So what we're trying to do is firstly minimise um, the amount of peat that's lost to the atmosphere, so reducing decomposition rates by raising the water table. Um, and raised water tables 
um, whilst we still farm on them, is, con is classed as paludiculture. So paludiculture is essentially wet farming. Um, so growing wetland crops um, on peat under wetland conditions. So in one of the field, and we have got five metre by five metre plots, four replicates of each crop that we're growing, and we're growing a variety of crops for different markets. So we've got Miscanthus, uh, which is for the bioenergy, and we're actually looking at three different varieties because we have some evidence to show that some varieties might fare better under the wet conditions. So we're testing different varieties for that reason. We've got Willow, short rotation coppice Willow, uh, we've got Phragmites um, and Typha, which are your more conventional polluticulture crops. And we also have um, just a control, so we're just looking at grass, wet grass. In the five metre by five metre plots, we are going there on a monthly basis. We're measuring the net ecosystem exchange. And then from that data, we are able to model for the whole entire year and create an annual carbon balance. So we know whether we've just reduced emissions or whether we've actually become a carbon sink. So we've got the plot scale experiments and then we have um, a scaled up experiment. And this is where we're gonna go full hog with some of the, the crops that have demonstrated potential GGR, greenhouse gas removal. We'll be scaling up Miscanthus and Willow. Um, so that'll be on a four hectare field and the flux tower allows us to measure the carbon balance across the whole landscape. So across the four hectare field. What we're trying to test is what sort of plants, how much biomass do we need to grow to make it a carbon sink, essentially. We have come across some pretty big challenges when this is scaled up. Rewetting the landscape is very difficult because it's not, you can't just rewet an isolated area, it tends to have implications on the surrounding landscape. So there are things that need to be considered when rewetting. So the, our lowland peat, agricultural lowland peat in the UK, uh, produces about 40% of our vegetables. Now, if we were to take all of that land out, then we would have to essentially meet that 40% demand elsewhere and then we run the risk of importing vegetables from other countries where we have no control in the farming practices and we don't know what the carbon balance from those vegetables are. We could move some of the vegetables into indoor areas, so greenhouses, but again we need to look at the trade-offs with that, so what implications does that have on the carbon balance? Methane emissions can be a problem with polluticulture because you're raising the water table and methanogenesis happens when the water table starts increasing above the ground surface, which could happen in, well, does happen in the winter. So we think that getting the system wet probably reduces the nitrous oxide, but then we need to shut down the methane. So we're looking at potentially actually biochar might be a way to do that. It seems to suppress methane production. We're also looking at adding sulfate as well, it's gypsum, it's fairly standard stuff, but it's um, the sulphate, basically there's bugs that will process sulphate that compete with the bugs that produce methane. So if we can get more of that in, we can sort of shut down the methanogenesis. So we're sort of messing around a little bit with nature, you might say, but we're looking at what we can do within the sort of broad context of peatland restoration, rewetting, and then actually can we sort of augment those processes in a way that will push the equation more towards carbon capture and greenhouse gas removal. We can reduce the amount of emissions that are put, being put back into the atmosphere from farming these landscapes, but actually achieving greenhouse gas removal, so sequestering carbon, becomes a little bit more complicated. We could potentially bring in biochar from uh, crops that are produced off of peat and use it literally as a repository to store that carbon into the system. Because of the anaerobic conditions, there is evidence to suggest that the, the biochar is probably more stable in that environment and therefore less of a risk to being lost to the atmosphere. Working with a biochar demonstrator on characterising the biochar, sourcing materials, again making comparable measurements across sites. Um, because we are trying to grow miscanthus and uh, willow, that those are the same crops that are being um, 
studied at least in part in in the biomass crop demonstrators. So we're working with them on sourcing material, doing consistent trials, measuring the same thing, so that we can compare between what grows on peat with what grows on the mineral soil, for example. You know, is it are we sacrificing yield, or actually does it grow fine on, on peat? Actually, one of the rock dust demonstrator sites, the one that we run from here at Plinlimon, that's got peat there, so we, we're talking to them too. I mean, they're not adding it to the peat, but there's peat within that landscape, so how do you potentially balance those two things in a way that doesn't, you know, damage the peat carbon stock in order to sequester carbon over there, and it's that kind of thing. Uh, and obviously the trees, there's trees on peat, and we're growing willow, potentially, which is, you know, the, the history of trees on peat is, is not a very successful one, as I mentioned. It's, it's tended to be drain it, chuck sitka on it, hope for the best, which I think everyone agrees wasn't a very smart thing to do. But are there, you know, there, there are forms of woodland on peat, you know, they're, they're compatible with wet conditions. They're still reasonably productive, some of them, like willow. We're looking at models that will work for them, whether that's carbon finance or whether it's sort of integrating carbon capture within a profitable business model, whether that's you know, biomass, renewable energy, producing biochar, there's a market for that. Because if there's no business model, then no right-minded farmer is going to do this. And, and if you're solely reliant on government grants for everything, then you know, government grants come and go. You know, if, you, if you capture carbon, you need it to still be there in 100 years, really. So it's no good doing something for two years while there's a grant scheme and then redraining it, you just lose the carbon again. So fundamentally, we're trying to get the, science, the basic science right, see what we can do, see how much carbon capture we can get, see if we can stop this methane emission. So yeah, we're, we're trying to sort of make those links where we can and, and also just work out what, what might work where, what might work in combination, what might conflict between different, different technologies so that you don't get perverse outcomes and ultimately try to maximise the overall benefit.